Enjoy your meeting. Really, um, most of the... Just a reminder, today's meeting is being recorded. Most of the disclosure is really not related to my talk, and probably the one disclosure would be that I have really devoted my um, really life on developing this device. Um, been doing this for about 13 years now. So I do have some I, I may be able to share with everyone. Okay, I'm going to, uh, in general, go through the instrumentation of EBA. Doing EBAs. Um, I will give general tips and uh, tips on needle manipulation during EBA. Okay? This is perhaps going to be the most important part of my um, talk today. Um, and this comes from lessons um, learned from fine needle biopsy. Um, and this is a, a very long history of uh, cytologists performing fine needle aspiration biopsies. Um, there's a lot of um, things that we can learn from this. And uh, certainly, I've been able to use um, the previous knowledge from cytologists uh, and apply that to EBUS. I'll talk a little bit about the importance of selecting the target when you do the EBUS. Um, what is also important is how you handle the specimen, because if you do not handle the specimen properly, you're not going to be able to give the cytologist a proper um, specimen. And I'll also talk about other technical aspects in general uh, concerning EVA cDNA. So in terms of the instrument, um, when you say endobronchial ultrasound, we have the radio probe EVAS and the convex probe EVAS. And I'm sure everyone on this web um, webinar um, is aware of EVAS technology, but today my talk is going to focus on the convex probe endobronchial ultrasound used for EVAS cDNA. Currently, fellow systems are from Olympus, Pentax, and Fuji Film. The um, slide that you show is the current Olympus convex probe EBUS system. This is a second generation EBUS scope, which has a 2.2 millimeter channel. The first generation had a 2 millimeter channel. Um, the optics is located here on my arrow, and it's a 35 degree port oblique view. And we use um, a balloon attached on the tip of the EVA scope and the dedicated needle uh, to do the EVA cDNA. Different processors can be used. The first uh, type, um, which is on the left, UC60, um, is not available anymore. They don't make this. Um, the EUME1 was the second generation, and the newest one on the market is called the EUME2. The Pentax EBA scope um, is um, slightly different than the Olympus system. The main difference is um, the CCD on the tip of the EBA scope. Pentax put the CCD on the tip, uh, which allows for a better endoscopic image. Um, the problem that I see by doing that is the uh, non-bending um, is a little bit longer uh, than the Olympus system, which um, kind of makes the actual EBUS DBNA a bit challenging, although the endoscopic image um, is uh, better. I think the um, Fuji uh, film system that recently came out is probably combining both of the technology, uh, Olympus and Pentax, and putting it into um, a relatively smaller uh, tip. So with the smaller CCD chip on the tip, it allows for a shorter uh, non-bending tip. Um, and also the unique part of this Fuji film scope is that it's a 10 degree forward oblique view uh, compared to a 35 forward oblique view for the Olympus system. So um, you have a better endoscopic image and you're seeing um, the image uh, similar to um, a regular flexible bronchoscope. So 
a combination of technology. Um, needles are important because even if you can see the lymph node without a needle, you will not be able to get any tissue. Uh, currently, there are the 21 gauge and 22 gauge needles available from Olympus. And there are other companies that have come up with different devices. The Metaglobe Sonotip Ebus Pro Flex is a um, made out of nitinol um, and uh, eliminates needle deformation. And I think everyone has experience when you are sampling uh, lymph nodes where you have to angle the tip of the bronchoscope significantly. Uh, once you do the biopsy, the needle tends to bend. Um, by using the night node needle, uh, Mediglobe has been able to eliminate the needle deformation. Um, I think one of um, a different needle that came out from Cook Medical is called the Procore Ebus needle. Now this name may confuse people because it kind of a that you're getting a core, um, the pro core needle, but the biggest difference is that it has a side hole on the tip of the needle which allows you to cut into the tissue, um, but you're only using a 22 gauge and a 25 gauge needle for this. So it's, it's really not a true core that you're getting. Uh, I do have experience with both um, the Olympus, the Mediglobe, as well as the uh, Procore Ebus needle. Um, there is a tendency that you would get more, relatively more bloody samples um, when you're using this side hole um, and needle. And there has not been any studies that have actually compared uh, the different needles. Um, I have done some comparison in uh, animal uh, models, which I have not published, um, but in general, my experience has been that uh, you tend to get a little bit of a bloody sample when you use a 22 gauge um, Procore needle. So this is to summarize what EVOS allows us to do. It, it was really first developed to um, stage patients with lung cancer for lymph node staging. Um, the extent of lymph nodes that are accessible um, goes beyond mediastinoscopy. And I think that is going to be a, stre uh, a strength in, in future management of patients with lung cancer by being able to sample the N1 nodes. Um, it, mainly, EVA's procedure is done uh, under local anesthetic with constant sedation, so it is a minimally invasive modality. Sensitivities reported have been very high. Um, and now it has been uh, considered the first choice of um, sampling lymph nodes in accessible um, areas. These are the other application of EBUS um, and uh, staging of lung cancer. You can use the EBUS scope for sampling intrapulmonary tumors as long as it's in the reach of the EBUS scope. Um, and there has been a growing um, evidence of use of EBUS for cycloidosis as well as uh, lymphoma. And I, I think in terms of lymphoma, the sensitivity varies from 57 to 91 percent, and this is really dependent on the, um, the person doing the performance on, and also um, the uh, cytologist uh, processing the sample. Now EBUS is considered the test of first choice as uh, shown in the uh, ACCP uh, clinical practical guidelines for lung cancer. So I think in less than uh, 10 years since it's uh, been in the market, um, I think there's been a significant um, amount of um, interest and in, uh, studies uh, on the use of EVAS DNA. So I've kind of gone through the literature and um, kind of will show some of the things that I've discovered and also share my experience. And, and today's really role was uh, this webinar was to um, help people improve their EBUS yield. Um, anesthetic for EBUS, there's different ways that are being done. I think it depends on the clinical setting, whether you do this in a um, operating room if you're a surgeon, 
um, or if you are doing this under um, sedation, if you do have uh, the proper um, personnel to do that. But in general, uh, it can be done with conscious sedation with uh, excellent patient satisfaction. Um, if you are doing this under general, um, probably using a laryngeal mask airway is uh, better than the endotracheal tube because by putting the endotracheal tube into the trachea, um, you are limited to sampling um, the lower peritracheal lymph nodes, and the higher peritracheal lymph nodes are um, somewhat difficult to sample. Um, but if you do decide to use a uh, endotracheal tube, you need a size larger than eight. Um, for LMA, you need a size four. Um, this is a most recent um, randomized control trial that was published by Roberto Casal in Texas, and uh, they looked at um, general anesthetic versus moderate sedation during EBUS tBNA. Um, and the goal of this study was to determine the, whether the types of sedation influences the diagnostic yield of EBUS tBNA. Uh, its complication rates, and also the patient tolerance. And in this study, um, there was no difference in the number of lymph nodes or lesions sampled per patient, constantly about three stations uh, with GA versus moderate sedation. The diagnostic yield was similar, around 70% for all comers. Sensitivity was similar. Completion rate was a little bit better in the general anesthetic group, 100% versus 93.3%. There were no major complications in both groups. But looking at the minor complications, um, there was a significantly more minor complication uh, with the moderate sedation group. So when we do EBUS, there are several things that you need to think about. And this, this slide is probably the most important slide of my talk today. It's unpublished data just based on my experience. And th this is the general tip. So always start with a white light bronchoscopy. Um, and this is for several reasons. If you are using the EBUS scope, you don't really uh, get a chance to see the mucosa very clearly, and you are limited to how deep you can go in with the bronchoscope. So I always start with the white light bronchoscopy, but it's not just for examination, but it's also um, application of local anesthetic throughout the airway. And I try to uh, give more uh, lidocaine, um, especially in the focus area where I will be sampling the lymph nodes. Also very important to keep the airway dry. With the white light bronchoscopy, I try to suction out all of the secretions before going in with the EBUS scope. Um, when you go in with the EBUS scope, be aware of the forward oblique view on the convex flow EBUS. There may be discussions about this later, but I always use the balloon in all my cases, except for patients with latex allergy. Uh, you get a better view of the uh, lymph nodes or your lesion. And even when you're doing the EBUS tBNA, I think that the balloon does help. The other key of performing a successful EBUS is to always keep the EBUS image, endoscopic image, clean. And this is probably something that needs a lot of practice. When seeing my um, trainees, although they might be able to do an EBUS tBNA, they sometimes have difficulties cleaning the camera head. Uh, so what I do is I try to rub the tip of the CCD camera on the right main bronchus or the membranous portion um, to really clear the fog. Also, avoid any blood from accumulating or any secretion from sitting on the camera head for a long time, because once you do that, you won't be able to clean the camera. The reason why it's important to keep the camera 
head clean is because when you do the actual tDNA, you need to look for landmarks on endoscopic image. It's the entry point. You're always looking endoscopically where you're going to um, actually wedge your needle, and this has to be between the cartilage. If you cannot see this, you're, you're kind of guessing. Um, if your needle hits the cartilage, your, your needle will push off your um, airway, you'll lose your ultrasound view, and you struggle. So look for landmarks on the endoscopic image. Um, when you are visualizing the lymph node, make sure you keep your EVA scope straight so that your hand holding on to the bronchoscope can just with your left hand, I use the left hand, um, you can visualize the lymph node at a certain angle. And you really have to memorize that angle of view uh, when you're entering into uh, the airway. Another thing that I have noticed when um, beginners start doing the ebiscope, they tend to hold um, the top of the needle for some reason. And when you do that, you won't be able to push the needle into the lesion. I try to um, hold the bottom part of the needle device and really fix your hand so that you can manipulate the needle and have control with your fingers. Um, next important thing, so you look for landmarks, you memorize the angle of the probe with your left hand, you then wedge the needle in the intercartilaginous space. When you push the needle in, you have to always maintain the appropriate angle, uh, which is with your left hand um, at the time of penetration because if you're trying, if you're struggling, if, if you push the needle in between the cartilage, and if your angle is off, the needle will only go in one direction. So even if the needle's in, you may not be able to get the target. So this is really the key steps um, when you're doing the EVA CBNA. I'm not sure if this um, movie is going to project very well, um, but this is to show you um, one of the cases that I recorded uh, about except Kaz, we're sorry to interrupt. I think we you're not sharing your screen anymore. Can you Really? Yeah. Can you just try again? Okay. You're right. Um When did I stop sharing? Just just uh, uh 30 seconds ago. Okay. 30 seconds. Sorry about that. My back? Can you see me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. So this is a short video that I recorded about um, six, seven years ago, and I still use the same technique. When you load the needle, um, always see your endoscopic image, and I, think I want everyone to appreciate how clean the endoscopic image is, because you're really looking, right now I'm looking at the endoscopic image, um, and I usually always have two big monitors to look at both um, ultrasound and the endoscopic image. You load the needle at the neutral position, um, then that's when you flex the tip. But what I'm looking at right now is really the endoscopic image. I try to wedge the needle right between the cartilage. Um, and if you look at my left hand, my left hand will never move. The angle will never move. And um, that's how you maintain the plane of entry. You can do that, and if you can avoid going onto the cartilage, then you can sample a very small lymph node like this case, station 4L, um, without any difficulties. So this is another, um, I, I think, very important um, thing that I, I would like everyone to really think about. And this slide was um, given to me by Dr. Getty, who is one of our cytopathologists. They have been doing 
fine needle biopsies for a long, long time. So if you look at the literature within cytology and fine needle biopsies, there's lots of data that actually you can use and implement when you're doing the EVA scope. Really the key of getting good samples is that when you put the needle into a lesion, it's really the forward stroke that is important. Um, and it's uh, the needle acts as a mini scalpel, which uh, dislodges the cell and tissue fragments from the surrounding stroma. So if you cannot do this forward stroke with the EVAS uh, tBNA, you're also not going to get anything. Um, and there's been lots of discussion about, you know, are you going to aspirate or not? Are you going to put suction or not? And from the literature, um, it appears that applying suction or not does not really affect the quality um, of the samples on F fine needle biopsy. And this is a little article about fine needle sampling without aspiration. Um, and I think the same concept um, would, you know, we can apply to EBUS DBNA. Now, why does fine needle biopsy fail? And this is, you know, slide is just about their experience in fine needle biopsies. And usual reason, reason for failure is sampling error. And this is exactly the same for EBUS DBNA. If you did not go into the right area within the lymph node, you're not going to get a good sample. And also, um, in very vascular lesions or lymph nodes, um, you're going to be filling your needle with blood. So if you have blood in the needle, even if you aspirate or if you move the needle many times, all you are going to get is blood. So in those cases, what they do is they use a smaller needle. And I think eventually this is what is going to happen for EBUS tDNA when there are smaller needles available. Um, I have some experience, experience using a smaller EBUS needle, um, and it gives you really excellent um, samples. So this is a picture a, of a sentinel um, axillary lymph node, and you can see uh, the part of uh, the tumor versus normal part of the lymph node. And if you really cannot sample the right place, um, a lymph node is a lymph node. There could be metastatic disease within one area of the lymph node. So really, the target is going to be important. So this is the central concepts of fine needle biopsy. You really need to spend time positioning. This is, or EBUS, you know, refers to positioning of the needle. Um, you cannot think that bigger needle will give you a better sample because it doesn't. Um, the needle has to move in the lesion, meaning that the needle has to really move with the target fixed. Now, if the target cannot be fixed, for instance, if there is a surface lymph node, if you can fix it, that's fine. But if you're trying to sample something that you cannot fix, a quick jab movement is really necessary. And this is exactly the same for EBUS. If you are sampling a relatively large lymph node, usually those lymph nodes are fixed onto the mediastinum. You can sample this very easily, but for smaller, normal-looking lymph nodes that are kind of floating within the mediastinum fat, then you really need to jab and move your needle very quickly to get any samples at all. Um, another key is um, don't leave the needle inside of the lesion too long because if you do, you're going to get a lot of blood. And if you do get um, the sample out, um, you should process the sample before it starts to clot because then you won't be able to process your precious sample. So this was about fine needle aspiration biopsy, and this really applies to EBUS-CBNA needle manipulation. 
needle movement is very important, and it's really the fourth stroke. Um, this, this really makes a big difference on the amount of tissue that you can get um, from uh, doing this. Uh, the needle has to really move within the lymph node. For small lymph nodes, quick jab motion is necessary. You need to target the lesion appropriately. Avoid blood. Don't leave the needle in the lesion too long. And try to process samples quickly to avoid clotting. Moment, how are we with the time? Are we still okay? Uh. Yes, we're doing okay. We have 10, 15 more minutes, and then we'll start the question. So you're good. Good. So th those were the really key uh, points, I think, that um, I wanted to share with everyone. But um, selecting the target, and I've, I've shown this slide, and I'm just going to go through it very quickly. Um, you know, understanding this sort of anatomy, what you are seeing around the trachea, around the bronchus, where is the lymph node, where is vascular structure is really key because you really have to memorize the landmarks um, when you are doing sampling of the lymph nodes. Um, this is in the right main bronchus. Uh, you have to understand that station 10R is uh, distal to the azagous vein. 4R is proximal to the azagous vein. If you mistake that, you're going to be upstaging the patient. Um, so this kind of bronchoscopic anatomy is very important. And for people who are interested in this kind of anatomy, I can uh, send you um, these slides. On the left side, you should be looking for the left main bronchus, identifying station 4L, station 7, uh, 10L. Uh, and when you go uh, down into the upper and lower lobe, what you should be seeing is or looking for uh, the main PA branching into um, the supersegmental branch, different branches of the PA, and the different lymph nodes around the different vessels. So you really need to understand this anatomy um, in order to really identify each of the lymph node stations. And up in the trachea, um, you have to identify the aortic arch and um, the subclaving artery, the brachiocephalic vein. Um, all of these um, structures, vascular structures, become key in identifying the different lymph nodes. This slide is also very important because once you start doing EBUS, you're going to be seeing many, many lymph nodes. And the more detailed examination you do, the more lymph nodes you'll see. And you'll recognize that there are lymph nodes that will start to look normal to you. And really to define that, we did this study a while ago, um, and we looked at thousands of lymph nodes, and we came up with this standard EBUS image classification. If the lymph nodes are small and ha is oval-shaped, uh, indistinct margin with a central hilar structure present, these lymph nodes are likely going to be um, non-metastatic. Now, if it looks um, suspicious, you always have to sample it. But I think the problem is if you see 15 lymph nodes, you cannot sample all of the lymph nodes. So you have to take into consideration um, the results of the PET scan, CT scan, the pre uh, investigational uh, probability of metastatic disease, and in addition, include this EBUS image that you're actually seeing during the procedure, and uh, think about what you need to sample. Also, you can look at vascular patterns um, within a lymph node, and you can maybe look at this uh, article that we published. Um, it's not as easy as the EVA standard classification, but um, when you use the Doppler mode to identify these vascular artery within the lymph node, you can actually grade them, grade the lymph nodes from grade 0 to 3, and that will help you identify uh, whether a lymph node is metastatic or not. Grade 0 and 1 negative finding 
uh, grade 2, 3, and the BA inflow sign as positive finding for metastatic disease. There are different ultrasound imaging modes um, that have been used in other fields other than the EBUS. Uh, we all know the B mode, M mode, and color mode, color Doppler, but there's also the harmonic imaging, elastographic imaging, contrast agents during uh, ultrasound, and I think these newer imaging modes will also become available uh, for EBUS as well. The EUME2 has a, a new um, modality, the pulse wave Doppler, the H-flow, and also the elastography. Whether this is going to be helpful or not, we're not sure, but in general, elastography looks at how hard the tissue is. And assuming that a harder tissue is going to be metastatic, you might be able to differentiate between a normal lymph node versus metastatic lymph node. This is a case with a benign lymph node on the left, more of a green color, versus malignant lymph node showing more of a bluish color. Um, so rapid on-site cytology is um, something that we always discuss about about meetings and um, this uh, the specimen handling there is, is very I'm not sure if you can see the video well but when I was in Japan this is the way that I was processing the, my specimens I would push out the core or blood clot into a filter paper and put this in formula and send that to pathology and the rest I would make a smear and send this for cytology so from one needle I would have a pathological specimen and also a cytological specimen, which allows us to uh, look at samples like this, and you would have the advantage having histology as well as cytology. But coming now to Toronto, where um, the cytologists have a lot of experience, experience we, we now do a, a bit of a different way of processing samples. If we have rapid on-site cytology, um, I give them a small drop on the glass slide, they make a smear, they will um, dry part of it, fix some of it on the alcohol, and the rest will go into a 50cc conical, um, which you can see in this video, and from this they will make a cell block, so we do not waste um, any of the aspirates, so everything goes to the cytologist. And based on this, they can make a cell block, and using the cell block, you can do different kinds of immunohistochemistry um, and do uh, all, all the mutational analysis. And one of the goals of rapid on-site cytology is really to optimize handling of samples, determining, determine if sampling of target has been achieved. And also, what is really important is the triage of material for ancillary tests. Now, if you do not have rapid on-site cytology, you have to figure out whether you need to do culture in the patient, whether you need to send it for lymphoma, for flow cytometry. That is something that you will not have with a rapid on-site cytology. But you should always be um, cautious about the results of rapid on-site cytology because it is rapid on-site cytology. It's not the, really the final report. We looked at our data from Chiba University um, of 438 cases, and we wanted to see um, how the rapid on-site cytology results correlated with the final results of cytology. And in our experience, there was no false positive. So if they call it positive, it was always positive. Um, that's in, in our experience, but there were 25 cases that was false negative on rapid on-site cytology, where um, on the final cytology, um, it was actually positive. There has been a study um, done by a Japanese group looking at a randomized controlled trial looking at the role of rows during EBUS. Um, they looked at rows versus no, verse, uh, no rows during staging for lung cancer. And they showed that um, having rapid on-site cytology is associated with a significantly lower need for additional 
a bronchoscopic for seizures, which kind of makes sense because you will have the answer right there. I'm going to skip this slide for the sake of time. This is probably the most recent publication. I'm not sure if everyone has seen this, but there has been a randomized controlled trial of the role of rows for lung cancer genotyping. I think this is very important. Um, they looked at using rows versus no rows, and the primary endpoint was the rate of successful molecular profiling for EGFR, KR, KROS for all, and uh, plus or minus ALK testing. And um, complete um, genotyping was achieved in 85.7% of the patients. The rose arm less likely to have samples that could only be used for pathologic diagnosis, um, and by having rose, more likely to have the bronchoscopy terminated after a single biopsy site. So, um, similar to what I, I showed you in the, the first slide, I think it does help um, in, in the management of these samples. I have several more slides. I should be done in a few minutes. Other technical aspects, which I'm asked a lot, how many aspirations should you do? Um, this is different than how many lymph node stations should you sample. Um, the first study by Lee from the Korean group, they looked at um, how many passes should you do per lymph node. And in this study, they do not use Rapid on site cytology, they did not have rap, uh, they did not look for molecular um, analysis in, in that setting. If you do three passes, um, you reach the plateau. So you should sample at least three times per lymph node to achieve the maximum yield. Now, how many lymph nodes should you sample to be called a proper staging? And in this lower uh, study, they uh, concluded that you should sample more than two mediastinal lymph node station. And from my experience as a surgeon, if you are going to call it proper staging, you must sample at least station 4L, 4R, and 7. Even if the lymph nodes look normal, unless you sample it, you're not going to be able to call it a proper staging. Uh, Larni Yarmus looked at um, how many passes needed for molecular analysis. And in their study, a medium of four passes were needed for adequate molecular profiling, profiling in 95.3% of their uh, study cohort. So I think in general, you need more tissue for molecular analysis. And you really have to decide based on what you're seeing if you do not have rapid on-site cytology. And the other question that I'm asked is, you know, do you use a 21 or a 22 gauge needle? And this was the first study that we looked at 21 and 22 gauge needle in various um, cases. And in our experience, there was no difference in the diagnostic yield. There was more blood contamination in 21 gauge samples. What I do right now is I usually use a 22 gauge needle, and I only use 21 gauge if a uh, lymph node is very hard, for instance, in sarcoidosis. Um, there is a big study, uh, again, from Lonnie Armist, looking at the CHOIR database, comparing 21 versus 22 gauge. And in this study as well, there was no difference in sample adequacy. But with rapid on-site cytology uh, available, there was significantly fewer needle passes uh, per procedure when using the 21 gauge needle. I don't know what that means, but in general, I, I don't think there is a difference in 21 versus 22. Suction or no suction, what you should avoid is giving the cytologist sample like this full of blood. And in order to do that, um, you can you know think about different things. This is a another randomized controlled trial um, comparing suction versus no suction. Uh, for EBUS, and in this study, there was no difference. And when you remember the slide that I showed you, uh, given to me by the cytologist, it, it's really not the aspiration that is important, but it's more of the movement of the needle. My practice, which is not published, I use the Doppler mode if I see a very vascular lymph node. Um, 
I try to avoid the vascular part of the lymph node. So in this case, I would try to go here. I would start with suction. If the aspirate is very bloody, I will repeat the procedure without suction. And when I do it without suction, I don't take out the stylet all the way. I pull it out halfway to achieve a capillary sampling. For subcrinal lymph nodes with very higher vascularity, I start uh, without suction. So this is my current practice, um, which I wanted to share. So um, to summarize, I think these are the um, take-home message for um, checking in in our webinar today. To understand the equipment, know your anatomy, find the appropriate target, meaning not just the lymph node. You need to find the right lymph node, but you need to find within the lymph node where you're going to place the needle. You should avoid the parts that are vascular. You should try to sample parts that look suspicious because even in one lymph node, there are parts that look suspicious versus non-suspicious. The needle, again, has to move in the lesion. And do not think that using a bigger needle or even syringe will give you a better sample. Um, and always try to avoid bloody samples and try to handle specimens properly. And when I say properly, it depends on your cytologist. So you should really sit down and discuss with your cytopathologist and come up with the best protocol that will suit you. So <clears throat> um, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. That is the end of my webinar. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, please stay on. We're going to open it for discussion and questions. Kazu, that was a, a tremendously informative presentation. Thank you for sharing your experience and wealth of knowledge. Uh, please type your question in the chat box. I um, see the first question, uh, Dr. Amir Abramovich. I'm going to unmute you and can you ask the question, uh, Dr. Abramovich? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, looking at the experience of our fellow uh, gastroenterologists, they are using the fanning method, which is actually bending the scope with the needles inside the, the lymph nodes, usually big nodes, in order to sample uh, various areas of the same node in <coughs> during one stroke. Um, I didn't hear about any experience um, using EBAS during that. Uh, do you have any experience with it or any opinion? Okay, can you um, repeat the first part of the question? Uh, uh, I, I was uh, looking at the experience of our uh, gastroenterology fellows during EUS they are using the fanning method, uh, uh, which, is, which, which in, that, in, the, in, in that way that you can move the, the scope with the needle inserted in the, in the lymph node or in the lesion, so you can actually sample various areas uh, without taking the needle out. Do you have any experience with that method? Yes, yeah, so um, if I may answer, what I tried to show is that because of the airway being very rigid, once you pass the needle, then you can't really move the needle like you can move during EUS FNA. The esophagus is very soft, so it's very easy to move and fan the needle. Um, that is really not possible in a way that you would be able to do it in EUS FNA. Um, so you, I think you need to really select the target. You need to direct your needle um, towards your target, I think. Um, it, it's, it's not, I've tried it, but it does not really work. Having said that, I do do EUS as well, and EUS is much easier to do that, just because the esophagus is very soft. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Amir. So fanning uh, is not recommended in EBUS, or I mean, it may or may not do anything. So uh, I have a couple questions, Kazu. First, um, w when you process your specimen, trying to expel it into the slide, does it matter if you use air to push the specimen out, or do you use a stylet to push it out? 
Um, I think that's a very important part of handling specimen. And as you saw in my video, what I do is I use the internal stylet um, when I have a cytologist, when I need to make a smear. Because if you use air to blow out the specimen, you'll end up giving them too much on the slide. So when you when you have the cytologist there, when you're when they're going to make a smear, or even if you don't have a cytologist, if you're going to make a smear, use the stylet, put a small drop on the glass slide. So for each glass slide, you make a very thin uh, prep. Now, if if we don't have the cytologist, what I do, I don't use the stylet. I just use the 50 cc conical or 20 cc conical and use the air to blow it into an alcohol fixative. We use the cytolite solution. For that case, I do not use the stylet. So you start with the stylet to put the, a drop on the, sm on the slide, and then you use the air to push the rest of it and in, potentially into the cell block, correct? Correct, if I have cytologist there. Okay. If I don't, Great. put everything in the uh, alcohol fixative without the stylet. Got it. One other question that comes up, people get frustrated. You know, you have the needle in the lymph node. Um, you see it under ultrasound. You come out, and there's really minimal sample or no sample. What is your explanation? What should the operator do at that point? So there's several things. And I, I kind of know this from watching my fellows, how they um, you know, get better in a year. Um, it, it's really two things. One, um, when you start doing this EBUS procedure, a lot of the people will fail to clear the tip um, of the needle. And most of the time, they won't be able to go through the airway in one shot. They'll end up you know, going into the cartilage. And each time you try to push your needle through the airway, if you can't go into the intercartilage space, you're going to have a lot of tissue on the tip of the needle. And once you're in the lymph node, you have to be able to clear that completely. Um, because if you don't, you're just going to be sucking on this cartilage or you know airway. So that's why you won't get it. But I, I think as you start doing this, you realize that. And once you get better going through the airway, and once you get better clearing the tip, then it's the problem of movement of the needle. Even if you move the needle within the lymph node, especially for small lymph nodes, you really need to jab and move the needle very quickly. Otherwise, you're really not going to get anything. And for larger lymph nodes, as I uh, show, shared in my slide, it's really the forward accelerated movement. You're, you're getting, you, you have to cut into the lymph node. Um, that, that, I think, is going to be the key. Great. Thank you. We have a question from Christina Bellinger. Christina, you're unmuted. Please uh, uh, tell Kazi your question. Oh, thanks very much. So uh, I recently had our pathologist switch from Phytolite collection. We were also doing similar needle rinses with air into the syringe, and they switched us to a saline solution. Uh, claiming that it was just as good, and I was wondering if anyone was aware if saline versus phytolite uh, affects yield. So I can answer that. Um, it will affect the yield depending on how long it takes um, you to bring the samples to the lab. Because um, if you put it in saline and if you do not process the samples quickly, the saline itself can blow up the cells. Um, saline is something that you should not keep your you know, cells in for a long time. So if you're going to process this quickly, saline is probably better because you can do flow cytometry, you can do culture, you can do various things. That's what is good about saline. But if you cannot take your samples to the lab immediately, you need to put it in alcohol fixative because you, you need to be able to fix the cells. Um, so I, I think it'll be more stable. And with the cytolite solution, 
there is a lysing component. So you know you you you're able to lyse the um, your blood within the sample. So that helps as well. The um, the issue with the cytolite solution is that once you put it in there, you won't be able to send it for culture. If um, if it's suspicious for lymphoma, you won't be able to do flow cytometry. So in my in our practice in Toronto General Hospital, when the cytologists are available, when they come for rapid on-site cytology, they usually take the sample. So we wash everything in saline because they will take it back to the lab immediately and process it immediately. And they have more flexibility of doing whatever test they want to do. But when we don't have the cytologist in the room, we, we cannot do that. So we uh, process everything inside a light solution. And we only have um, cytologists available for two cases per day. Um, they only come for 10 cases per week uh, for EBUS procedures. I think they figured out when I came f to Toronto first, they were coming for all my cases, but they quickly figured out that I'll be doing many, many cases, so they're kind of smart. <laughs> I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. Kyle. Thank you. One more question. Um, sometimes uh, you just can't get the needle to go through that lymph node. It's calcified, or there's, uh, you know, and it's just you're trying your hardest, you're jabbing it quickly. Do you have any tricks? Is it, is it just a calcified, you know, especially in elderly folks, sometimes we have this problem. Do you have any tips or anything for that? Well, you need to come to the Yasufuku Dojo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. But um, sometimes for the large lymph nodes, I sometimes what I do is I take the stopper off, even if it's a relatively small node, um, and um, being able to advance the needle up to four centimeters, you, you sometimes get a better stroke. Um, sometimes you might end up going into the PA, oops, but, but sometimes that will give you that extra push to be able to penetrate into the capsule. It's, it's usually the capsule of the lymph node um, and also for really hard lymph nodes. I think um, for patients with very calcified lymph nodes or uh, sarcoid, burnt out sarcoid cases, that's when I tend to use the larger 21 gauge needle because sometimes it does help um, getting the you know fibrotic tissue. I hope that helps. So it's really the yeah. accelerated motion, I think, um, that's the key. <clears throat> wonderful. Well, I think we're coming to an end here. Uh, this was wonderful, Kazu. We'll get uh, feedback from, uh, oh, there's one more question, I think. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a, a suggestion or answer. This was wonderful. I think people enjoyed it. We'll, we'll uh, hope to hear feedback from the participants today. Uh, by the way, this is, will be, this is recorded, so you'll be able to watch or hear this on the AABIB website. We'll send you a link. Uh, also, we're going to have to do many, many, we'll, we'll do many, many webinars, hopefully once a month or every two months. Hopefully this will add value to you guys, our members in the AABIP. Again, Kazu, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for coming to uh, participating with us here for an hour. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for the organization moment. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.